Great. Okay. So today I'm really happy to be here with Lorraine Taylor, who is uh, specialized in teaching feminine yoga. So the feminine way of practicing yoga, bringing forth the, her love of Tantra and Kashmir Shaivism. And she's been running particular teacher trainings for the last 10 years and teaching around the world on various other teacher trainings. But her core focus at the minute is really bringing yoga to women in the feminine way. And I'm super excited to hear a little bit more from you today, Lorraine, uh, about what is feminine yoga? Mm -hmm. A really good question <laughs> a really good question that i don't think there's any right answer to that you know i think it's individual for everybody to answer that in their own way so i'm just going to describe what it is for me because when we start to separate masculine and feminine we get into difficulty obviously because everybody has masculine and feminine inside however saying that the way yoga has been passed down to us, it's been passed down over the thousands of years, uh, mostly by men. I mean, like 99%, you know, probably 99.9. <laughs> there were a few women dotted about here and there. Um, but when I was practicing yoga, the yoga that's been passed down to me as, as, a, as a woman, um, I started to just feel that it was very angular. It was very linear. There was something that mm, it didn't resonate anymore with me. I enjoyed learning all the alignments, learning the techniques of yoga and listening to the philosophy. And I was so interested in, in the whole concept of yoga. And it wasn't until about, mm, I've been practicing, I'd say for over 10 years, that I started to feel like, okay, I need to do this in my own way. It needs to really suit my body. It needs to fulfill me on a heart level, not just on a physical level, but like it needs to inspire me. Um, and I questioned various things, like I was questioning do we have to hold our breath with this chin lock, like with my head down in my chest and, and really forcefully hold my breath and increase that over time to become what? <laughs> Where am I heading? Like all of these questions started to come in to me. And I found that I am inspired much more by the softness, by the richness, by the, the more poetic flavor of life, not just yoga. So what would inspire me is then I started to meet, meet teachers who would like read poetry in their class or it wouldn't be like this forceful approach to hatha yoga, it would be more of a surrender into who we already are, you know, like that we're not trying to get anywhere, we're not trying to push and force our way to a place that is in the distant future, which is enlightened or, or whatever uh, we want to call that. Um, but it's actually about recognizing what is here right now and appreciating that and softening into that and embracing that and it just seemed to make a lot more sense. <laughs> but it's probably because I've been pushing and forcing for a while, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, oh, I don't have to do that. Yeah, of course, this makes much more sense for my body. You know, Can I was- you say a little bit more about that pushing and forcing? Because personally, as I know you personally a little bit, I know that you come from a background of much more kind of strict mm -hmm. way practicing as well and maybe even having been a gymnast in your youth um, mm. so you could maybe share a little bit more about your own journey of discovering that softness not just as a I'm too lazy to push through but you know I've actually found this to be more suitable or offering a much more richness on a different level mm -mm. yeah yes I was a gymnast so I was very much pushed and I, I, I think actually that's why when I came to yoga, I was not looking for that approach. Um, 
yeah, I was, I was definitely, was definitely very regimented, the training and the practicing and jump higher and, and be more flexible and win the medals and all of that. And I enjoyed it. I had a lot of energy as a kid. So anything where I could like <laughs> click lack about or somersault from things I really enjoyed. And I was a dancer, I was an ice skater. I was just constantly exploring the body and moving around. Um, when I got into yoga, I actually got into it because I wanted to heal my body from all of the gymnastics that I'd done. And so I was about 21 when I first found my uh, first class, which was Iyengar. And I didn't really understand yoga. We were in a triangle posture and I just after all of the somersaults and, and crazy things I'd done with my body, I, I actually found it really boring. I was like, well, I don't know why we're doing this, but it's supposed to be good for me. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to stay with it. And then at the end of the class, we went into the lying down posture, Shavasana. And it was when I got up from that, I felt amazing. I felt different. I felt happy. And it really confused me. I was like, why am I happy? <laughs> that class was really boring. I do, like, I've no idea why I feel, oh my God, what is this? You know? So I started to discover and I stayed away from the more pushy types of yoga uh, or the more strong or strict um, teachers. And I was doing a lot of kind of feminine yoga, um, vinyasa flow with uh, a woman who was a teacher called Shiva Ray, who had amazing music and very dance-like. She was also a dancer. So I really resonated with that and in inspired me. And I did some teacher training and then I, with her, and then I um, started to teach. And I was teaching a lot of vinyasa flow classes and making up sequences and playlists. And I got to a point where I was like, okay, I'm done. I just want a one sequence. <laughs> and I don't want any music. Like just, I'd just done it too much. So I, my friend said, well, that's Ashtanga. I was like, oh no, I don't like Ashtanga. It's very contortionistic and gymnastic and I don't want that. And she said, just come. There's a really good teacher on our beach where we live. And so I went down to the uh, sala and I started to do Ashtanga and it was really beautiful. Really beautiful because when you go to Mysore style, you do the practice in your own time when you're in a leg class in Ashtanga, you have to go quickly with the teacher and the rest of the group. And that's where like injuries can happen. And it's, for me, it's too fast. But my soul style, you can go as slow as you want. So I started to do Ashtanga, which I had always felt was not my style, but you know, as we change and, and you discover a good teacher or a, a place where they're doing it, in a different way and I loved it and it brought me really really deep within I actually got a little bit I had an old whiplash injury so I couldn't go so much through the sequence and this actually made me brought me into a very meditative space because I couldn't really rely on the physical or get caught up in finishing the sequence and on to the next sequence but I had to go really slowly with this neck injury that I had. And it's then that I found like, wow, the power of the breath and the relaxation and the simplicity and how we don't have to keep pushing or moving. Where am I going? What am I trying to get? <laughs> I just like came into myself and I was like, wow, this is, yes, this is what I'm looking for. Mm, beautiful so actually you came from gymnastics went to flowy yoga and then back to something that probably most of our audience would also identify as quite masculine and talking yeah. about Ashtanga. Yeah. Uh, I'm also be curious you mentioned already it was more about tuning in slowing down doing it in a different way but how because I know that you're still using Ashtanga sequences also in your teaching mm -hmm. how do you make it 
something feminine then? How do you really bring that uh, element in? That Because mm -hmm. maybe, maybe, you know, it yes. doesn't sound like Ashtanga is made for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it doesn't, does it? It's, it's, it's quite interesting how this has come about. I was uh, studying the Mahavidyas and the Mahavidyas are the wisdom goddesses of Tantra. They're from Shakta Tantra. And understanding that there are different energies that lie within us, all of us. So it's not just for women, it's also for men. And there are strong energies, powerful, fiery energies. Um, there are gentle energies. Like there is in nature, you know, big, like, waves and earthquakes and, and tsunamis, volcanoes erupting and all of that. And then you've got your, you know, gentle breeze and the gentle stream and all of this. So we see this in nature, all of these different energies. And I was exploring them and realizing that all of them are inside of me and I can approach my practice in that energy. And it's interesting because it was like, hmm, I was with somebody who said to me, um, oh, you should be soft and surrendered as a woman. <laughs> we were in a relationship and I was like, oh, right. <laughs> and quite immediately I, I said to him, oh no, that's not true, you know? And it wasn't like I was arguing with them. I just went, no, no, it's not true because we have, these different energies within us and sometimes I'm fiery and other times I'm loving and sometimes I'm soft <laughs> you know um, and it really helped me in my life to come to recognizing that and understanding myself and then that came through into my practice and then that came through into well any practice that you can do it's not like Ashtanga has a specific resonance with this. It was just that I like the Ashtanga sequence if it's done in a more mindful and uh, modified way. I think it's a very beautiful moving meditation. And it really brought me deep in my own practice. So I wanted to teach this to others. And um, so we use the Mahavidyas. Um, showing that yeah you can do the sequence fiery and you can do it very very modified and very slow and you would even hardly recognize it's ashtanga hmm. Quite so how, can I, how can i really imagine uh bringing in one of these 10 goddesses uh, while doing my ashtanga practice maybe I mean, mm. i've experienced it with you but uh, for whoever is listening now uh and they're like what what's that how, how can you do that what are you talking about <laughs> yeah well um let, let's pick a goddess like tara tara is probably one of the well-known the most well-known around the world uh in china she's Quan yin and lots of different countries have their version of tara um we choose or i choose to work with the white tara the compassionate the very healing aspect um, because it's so beautiful to cultivate this in our movement. And you could cultivate this in dance, in yoga, in meditation, in many different ways, you know. But when we're doing this with the practice of Ashtanga, we modify everything. So we see how um, gentle we can make the practice, which is an eye opener because it's always seen as something that's very. Uh, strong and powerful and contortionistic and um, we focus on compassion through the practice so when we are in a posture then having that reflection and meeting anything that comes up so quite often we're in a posture and we're looking into how does the body feel Okay, can I feel the energy? Is my breath moving? But then we can go into deeper places like, uh, what is my mind saying? Like watching my thoughts or the emotions coming up. Maybe there's a difficult emotion. So we're learning how to meet ourselves compassionately um, 
just by being there for ourselves rather than avoiding or getting caught up and going into a difficult place in the posture, we are cultivating an, an awareness to stay present and to meet everything that's arising. And so this is a really beautiful thing that we can do in our, in our practice. So even somebody that is not familiar with uh, Tantra and the 10 wisdom goddesses could potentially put an intention into their own practice, uh, whatever that might be. Maybe it's, you know, determination and focus or compassion and do every single posture in that manner, basically. What yes, yes, yes. I, I really love to make it practical and not esoteric and, and puts people off. I, I just feel like my interest is in how can people help, um, how, how can it improve your life, your relationships, you know, otherwise, what are we doing it for? Yeah, that's a great point. I'd love to actually hear a little bit more about that, because a lot of what we do within this context as well is even with the EYP system, embodied yoga principles and other ways, that embodied component and the question of how to take yoga off the mat or like, What's the point in, you know, doing certain yoga postures if it, if it doesn't have an impact? So one, I'm curious, what impact did you notice in yourself practicing this way? And also, um, yeah, what's your approach now teaching that? Mm, good question. Well, I just became with, with the Mahavidyas um, and the practicing with the different energies in my own practice and teaching it as well on trainings, I just became, you. it's like you develop a better relationship, you know, with those energies and they trickle into my life. It's almost like once you, you're practicing and you're learning how to connect with compassion and then you find all sorts of things. Oh, I can't be compassionate with myself or, oh, I'm just thinking all the time and I can't stop identifying with my thoughts. So we learn in yoga to create more space, more awareness, more presence, which naturally trickles into your life. Um, but specifically with the Mahavidyas, I just become more connected with the energies. And as a result, that just naturally trickles into my life. So if I'm having a bad day, and I'm not saying that this happens every time, but <laughs> of course I have my moments of ah, <laughs> but um, there is a greater ability now to be um, there for myself. I was just telling my uh, students the other day, actually, that um, before I'd be like, what's wrong with me? You know, if something goes wrong in life, what's wrong with me? I'm doing all this yoga and I'm still not happy. And oh my God, my life's a mess and all of this. And now actually I've just um, got more of an ability to actually just hold myself and go, oh, you poor thing. <laughs> they were all laughing, but I, I thought that's, that's actually really something, you know, it is something that's, um, it, it's transformed my life. It sounds little, but it's huge. And I assume that you have a daily practice for yourself and then do you just go about it choosing a random deity every day or like a random goddess or how, how do you approach that then? I am um, um, not practicing yoga every day like what it would look like on a sticky mat and lifting my leg up and postures and breathing and everything um I do that it's so nice you know to get to this age because you just um I just feel more at peace with myself if I want to do my practice if I want to do a yoga practice which sometimes I do like definitely during covid when I was recovering from covid I was doing kapalabhati I was doing all these like cleansing of the lung and boosting the brain and, and all of these things. Um, I was very grateful to yoga and I'm teaching a lot. So I'm always moving my body. Um, in my own practice, you know, I started to come out into like, how can I live this rather than be on my mat all the time? 
because I did years and years of that. And sitting there with my eyes closed doing my breathing techniques. I do do that sometimes. I would say oh, maybe twice a week as a, on an average. But I also love to go on to go outside and, and walk. And I love to bring that um, into, yeah, into daily life. Like, how can I just go out and be with nature? Or how can I go for breakfast this morning and really honor myself and be here and relax into myself? You know, I always felt like I should be doing something. <laughs> Let's do something. I need to practice because I need to, I don't know, get better. <laughs> um, and I'm just more at peace with myself. Mm. And I guess also if it doesn't actually transfer into having breakfast in a compassionate manner, a kind way with yourself, then what's the point in adding another hour on a mat? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, so it's like the Mahavidyas are there when I need them. Mm. Those energies are inside of me and that's become clearer over the years. And so I feel like I just know myself more deeply and I trust myself and that gives me peace that brings peace mm. yeah. yeah and I no. guess it comes with practice in the end as well so you can't just go oh okay I'm bringing in this this goddess today uh, without actually maybe <laughs> embodying and practicing on the mat and then hope that your life changes from one day to the next is it <laughs> yeah exactly just buy a picture, <laughs> picture. Of Tara, put it up on the wall and hope for the best. <laughs> I've also done that. <laughs> yeah. I have another question because I'm also aware that you're at the moment focusing on teaching women in particular. Mm. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit more about why, why you, you've chosen that? Because in previous trainings before you embarked on that particular path, you've also taught men and now that's your focus. So yeah. Yeah, I was an exploration. I just wanted to explore what it would be like to teach women. I, I found that the people in the class who were the most appreciative were women at that time. And so the guys were like, well, we wanna do stronger stuff. Like, can we do arm balances and handstands? And I just didn't feel inspired because of, my gymnastic background I kind of shied away from doing all that stuff so I didn't have the motivation to do that and I just thought oh they should really go to another teacher because there are teachers doing that and I wanted to focus on the more we could call it feminine, but the more um, poetic, singing, poetry, um, meditating in a different way, not just this rigid kind of close your eyes, back straight and, you know, go in and don't think. <laughs> I wanted to explore different ways of meditating and breathing in a softer way in pranayama. And it just seemed to have this quality of the feminine. It, it, so women would love it. And they would actually say to me, um, can we do this? <laughs> Is this allowed? <laughs> Which I know what they mean because for a while I was so conditioned in this masculine way because that's what's been passed down. And there was a voice inside of my head that kept saying, um, oh, you have to keep to the tradition. You know, you can't change it. You won't be authentic. You have to stay with what's being passed down. Otherwise people are gonna look down on you. They're gonna think you're flaky, you're superficial, all of that. And one day that voice in my head, oh, well, I just said, okay, enough. You know, I want to do this. Um, I want to move my body the way I want to move it. It was, it was a very empowering moment. You know, it was a moment of like, oh, I don't care what anybody else says. I'm going to do it my way. It's my body. It's my life. I'm going to breathe this way. This makes me go deeper. And if I move this way, it feels good. And 
I'd had enough training in the in the other um, yoga to feel confident in that. And then I got the courage to teach it. <laughs> and then women were like, oh my God, we love this. <laughs> I was like, yeah, <laughs> don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's how it came about. Mm. And I'm very aware of that uh, space of a yoga teacher training built with only women uh, is also just a little bit different to a training that is mixed. So, uh, Absolutely. And I think men, when they get together, they will share more if there's not any men around. Mm -hmm. And you can just relax, let your hairy armpits out. And, you know, you <laughs> it changes the energy when there are men also there. And, and yet, you know, I know that there are men who want this this feminine style as well. So it's something that I'm thinking about opening up maybe at some stage to men and women, because um, when I was in Sweden, for example, I was at the Tantra Yoga Festival there and it was the men who came up afterwards. This was a couple of years ago and they were like, oh, we loved it. And they had tears in their eyes and they were like, it was so soft and Enter and I was like oh my god <laughs> there goes my theory of like <laughs> women need this men need it too no? yeah and I'm, even if we're talking a lot about this is for women and this feminine yoga obviously we're not excluding that this no. might, might not have value or the other way around that for women there might not be value in approaching a really strong yeah. masculine practice either yeah so just to clarify that as well but it's really yeah. how and the why I guess it's more yes. like that comes in of like why do I practice like that because I want to develop compassion because I want to develop something yeah. and I want to maybe even uh, reach that stage of empowerment of really trusting and listening into my own body rather mm -hmm. than maybe like a lot of yoga just listen to the teacher and do whatever they tell me to do <laughs> yes yes and I'm much more about um, like find your own alignment you know, we've got all these rules of alignment, There's so much around alignment in today's yoga world and turn your little toe like two millimeters to the left and things like that. And it's, and it's so much conflicting information as well. One teacher says this, the other teacher says that, da, la, la, who do you believe? And it came to me like, I know how I feel. I know what feels better, you know, but that came after a few years of study and you get the confidence to feel empowered in your own body. But I like to outweigh because I feel it is empowering for people to come back to their bodies, mm. especially when that power has been taken away from them, you know, to say to them, like, you know how you feel. Like, I, you know, so I'm constantly reminding students to go there. Yeah. So how do you go about when somebody comes to you and they actually don't have a good connection to their own body and maybe have lost that, feel a bit disembodied and maybe, um, you know, there are different reasons for that, obviously, but yeah. how would you help them? Because maybe the, that trust in the body simply doesn't exist. Yeah. They don't actually know what uh, a healthy alignment would be uh, and they might need some guidance um, to relearn. Yes, yes. But yeah, it's true. There is that. And um, I just teach people to go, like to be patient, to go slowly, to relax as much as they can into their body, to not to breathe deeply, but to make sure the breath feels comfortable. I think just providing a, a, a like a safe space where they can start to unwind, they can start to relax, they can start to, you know, the tears may flow. A lot of people are holding um, a lot in their bodies, a lot of trauma, a lot of wounding. And so I try to stay away as best as I can um, from telling anybody, you know, um like you can feel this or you can't you know like telling them what they it's it's very tricky because there are people who just don't feel anything so I have to bear that in mind when I'm teaching and also just say that to people you know you might not feel you might not be able to connect 
to your body. If you don't, keep breathing. Keep relaxing into the posture. Um, and also, if it doesn't feel right uh, to come out of the posture, um, in order to feel the body again, I think people um, have to feel safe. They have to relax. So just um, cultivate an, a, a, like a place of understanding, of compassion, of safety as much as you can. Telling them, you know, everybody's different. Some people don't feel energy. Other people do feel energy. Some places in the body are hard to connect to. Mm. Um, you know, especially around the pelvic bowl area. That's an area that we've, you know, cut off a lot of us. And, you know, I don't tell them this, but even, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's been abuse, like really strong abuse. It's just, you know, I was brought up as a Catholic and it was like, you don't go there, you don't show, you don't touch that area, you don't even think about it. <laughs> you know, it was like, wow. So I never been abused or anything, but I had to work a lot on reconnection mm. to that area. Yeah, even if it's just the shame that we've culturally or yeah, you know, it is and, um, yeah. And how do you stop people from feeling shame? Mm. You know, the I mean, just by being yourself, being authentic, creating a safe space, being compassionate, offering some words of like self love, and and little by little, people can start to trust and open. I feel. Mm. So when you're saying safe space, and I already heard you use the word trauma as well, and obviously within yeah. yoga, you know, there have been um, not only uh, yeah, scandals or other things happening where, that, you know, maybe consent wasn't necessarily part of the deal. Or um, So I know that you've been teaching alongside other teachers as well in trauma-informed and trauma-aware yoga, and yeah. in your own trainings, you really put an emphasis on that. Yeah. Uh, and also really encouraging and like emphasizing the element of consent, but also informing about historically the um, yoga world, maybe not having been that. Yes. You can say a bit more about that too. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I feel it's really important um, to um, talk about this because it, it's something that's changing very much, definitely in the last. 10 years there's been a, a huge increase in like the me too campaign and and then um trauma informed uh trauma awareness has grown massively with people like gabor mate and um thomas hubel and and um vessel van der Kolk, you know just coming in with um how important how trauma is stored in the body and it's it's so beautiful to like know more about this i i you know i still don't know enough i think it's an endless project of of learning deeper and deeper about ourselves and being able to help others with what's going on for them too because the postures and the these practices any spiritual practices are going to bring up things for people and tears will come and they don't know why they're crying and um, sometimes reactions you know anger can come or strong emotions or difficulty trauma responses may be there where they freeze um, so there's all sorts of things that can actually happen in a yoga class. And I was never taught about this, you know, when I did my teacher training, it was never a part of the teacher training. So I've had to learn as time went on about how to be more aware. And it was actually through my own trauma that, I mean, this is how we learn, isn't it? From like a direct experience of what is going on with me. Um, to finally find and solutions and things that help with uh, calming the nervous system and healing trauma and things like that. So that's definitely become a big part um, of my interest because I think it's very beneficial just for everybody, but especially in the yoga world. 
because we have had a lot of abuse and there have been any area where you get somebody on a pedestal as a guru or a politician or a teacher then hey let's <laughs> let's just be careful you know it, there can be a lot of abuse that happens because there yeah. is a, a tendency for that narcissistic personality to to want to go there you know I want to be on the top and telling everybody what to do and to be authoritative and things like this and um it's triggering especially when people have got trauma hmm. and i can imagine that it's both ways around i mean once you are on a pedestal maybe for teachers yeah. to be aware of that you know that could be a power trip of like oh everyone's listening to me so i guess yeah. you're addressing that in your teacher trainings as well but equally uh hmm. to inform students or to spread awareness about how there's always an, a, a power dynamic at yeah. play enter a classroom yes. There's some some degree of, you know, the teachers up front there and maybe I have to listen to them or like there might be very subtle um, dynamics going on. And then suddenly I give my agency away and maybe my choice. Yeah. And yeah. So how, how would you say what can students look out for in a class to mm. um, like make sure that it's a safe environment that I can feel good mm. in? Well, I teach about trauma awareness you know my teacher trainings um, I'm trying to help um, the teachers the new teachers be more trauma aware and uh, I'd say the first thing is is to give choice and um, you know when people have been traumatized normally choice has been taken away from them so to give them as I was just saying that power back into it's your body you choose which um, position you want to go into. So it can be a modification. It can be a very gentle posture. They can not do the posture um, or they can go into like the full pose, you know? So just so they know that that is in their power to choose. Is that's something. something you can take for granted. I've been to yoga classes where the teacher would not have been happy at all if somebody would not go into the posture. <laughs> No, I've been in the yoga classes where a very famous teacher stood over me with the little mic and told me to get up into a back bend. And I was so tired that I was resting on the floor and I looked at her. She's literally standing over me. I'm lying on my back on the floor and she's looking at me in the eyes and um, very famous. I won't mention her name, but I was like, wow. You know, and I looked at her and I went, no, <laughs> it felt so good. <laughs> but somebody else who had been threatened by their dad and their, you know, or their mom or, you know, was traumatized and didn't have that ability to say no, would have just gone in and, and you know, thrown themselves up into the posture and could have hurt themselves. So it's pretty awful, you know. And as a teacher, like what we want to cultivate is, is empowerment in others. So this kind of like, you know, making people scared to do the postures. You know, if I ever like say to somebody like today, actually, I was asking the students, like I can encourage them. I was like, try to sit up straight, you know, because if we're lounging about and this is our tendency so there's a fine balance of like encouraging and inspiring um but then also offering like why you're saying that if you're not like just if you're just saying sit up straight you know long spine <laughs> and then people are just doing what you say it, it creates a really weird energy in the room anyway so i would say lift up through the spine and and I'm saying this because it's going to strengthen your spine over time and then it's going to become easier, you know, in the postures to your, your back will be stronger. You'll be able to, um, a lot of people have lower back pain, blah, 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 all of that. Like I always try to give a reason mm. why I, if I am ever insisting on something and I'm not insisting, I'm encouraging, I would say. Mm -hmm. and also saying but if this is not okay then please lie down yeah 
because I mean I'm aware that you're not just going like oh you don't have to and you're like you know yeah. But there can be a bit of fire in that as well. As we spoke earlier, that's one quality that the, the 10 Mahavidyas, the goddesses can bring too, and the fierceness, but then still having having that choice element come with it. So you might be able to cheerlead or you know, push someone a little bit, but still keep it open to deny or say no. Yeah, um, yeah, totally, totally. And I think that's the main thing. I mean, there's all sorts of things like, the, the postures that you do, you know, can be triggering for people who've had sexual abuse and things like that. So just to be aware of those. And if somebody does have a reaction or starts to cry or has a panic attack or what, what to do then and how to deal with. I, I mean, I didn't know what to do when somebody cried. And I think we're not taught these on, this on teacher trainings and it's such an important thing. You know, I, I've seen teachers run over to the student and like hug them, you know, <laughs> like just throw themselves, oh, you okay? And it's like, we're all doing our best, but there are better ways that we can learn to, to deal with these situations when they come up. And quite often like the teacher's human as well. And the teacher just is like, oh, I don't know. I feel uncomfortable with tears. I don't know what to say. So yeah. it's just about looking at those things and finding the most helpful way to approach. Yeah, it's probably being helpful, knowing how to hold the class, not run to one student that is crying and over yeah. being trying to comfort them but um also possibly not taking on too much i mean what i've experienced as well is yoga teachers suddenly having to fulfill the role of a million different other things you know they suddenly are approached like a nutritionist or a life coach or even a therapist and maybe to keep yeah. that in as well that you know what you're teaching is yoga maybe what the students can expect and to kind of frame that in the particular way as well that uh, there isn't any overlapping and taking on a uh, response yeah. for beyond your expertise. Isn't yeah, totally, totally. And when I was first a yoga teacher, I did think that I was like, oh, am I going to help them? <laughs> oh, no, he's got like, a, you know, an injury in his shoulder. How am I going to heal it? Or somebody is depressed or anxious. How am I going to fix them? And, you know. I kind of had to learn all this information wasn't really around when I did my teacher training. Um, but I've learned over the years. Yeah, just to feel like to know your place as a yoga teacher. You're not supposed to do all those things, but you can have a great team of people that you know and you can say, hey, I've got a, an amazing person down the road who does this. Yeah. Mm. And I know you bring in a lot of wonderful guest teachers as well into your trainings and you have a lot of people you work with, collaborate with uh, that bring in maybe also unique to the women's approach or feminine yoga. Um, yeah. Typical wisdom, teach uh, Ayurveda, teach different angles that are also particularly relevant for women. Um, yes, yeah. yeah, like menstruation. Like what to do? I mean, this has been the big question for a long time in the yoga. What do we do? Can we do shoulder stand when we're bleeding? Like, <laughs> why not? Why? And it's always been a mystery. And it's probably because men don't bleed. <laughs> and they were the ones who passed down the yoga. So they were like, oh, we don't know. Yes, no. Yes, go up. No, don't. <laughs> um, and so what I got is in this teacher training. Yeah. Um, information on menstruation and so much around that like how we feel during the different times of the month as women are very we're running on this this cycle you know and we don't feel like doing the same practice at every day during the month and we shouldn't be doing the same practice of course we can do as one sequence like ashtanga but changing it to adapt to how you're feeling in that moment is really important. Mm, yeah. Yes, absolutely. We're all contextual and changing over time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I would, I'd be curious to hear one last thing with regards to the, the element of embodiment, because we're on the embodiment podcast as well. So how would you, in your own words, say, what makes your particular approach to yoga embodied? Or my own practice or the way I teach? How you teach as well. 
Nein, ist nicht okay. Um, hmm. Well, I think that the, my focus is about how to bring it into my life. Yeah, so how to integrate what I'm learning on my mat when I'm looking into my own patterns and my own thoughts and emotions and everything that's arising. How can I do that when I'm in the cafe and talking to my partner or my cat or my, you know, my boss or like can, is anything changing within me? That, that's been something that's been really um, interesting to me. Is it making me more free? It's not even about like, oh, now I'm a, a much better spiritual person. <laughs> I don't get angry anymore. <laughs> so <I'm> that, was, <laughs> that was my first understanding of, oh, how I'm going to change. It's going to be like that. You know, I'm going to be very calm and I'm going to be very spiritual. And, and now I think I'm more into, hey, let's just be real. Yeah, let's be authentic. Let's be honest. Let's um, not just go around screaming because anger's okay, but to allow myself to scream when it is really, really necessary, you know, and not feel bad about it. Like, oh, I'm a bad spiritual person. I needed to scream. Um, try not to scream at anybody else because it's shocking for their nervous system. And, but the, the anger itself is not bad. So I've, I've come into a, a better relationship, I'd say, with my own emotions, because in spirituality, actually, you do get taught a lot, especially in non-duality, oh, rise above the emotions. The emotions are superficial. And there was almost like this teaching that I was taken on that, oh, one day I'm going to transcend the emotions. <laughs> this is what some teachers are teaching. And I was listening and believing or at least looking into it and having a go. And <laughs> I'm glad I couldn't uh, transcend my emotions because they're really important. And it's about honoring the emotions. The emotions bring so much color to our life. You know, without the emotions, we'd be like, <laughs> like this mechanical robot you know very dry and boring life would be without the emotions so I learned to honor my emotions I learned to see what the mind was good for I learned to like befriend myself I would say is a good word I like that word befriend and and that as I said it comes into your life, your relationships, the things that are important, and then it's embodied. It's not just on your mat. And so that is really my passion. It's my focus in these teachings. Thank you so much. So if now people are curious to find more of what you're offering, because I know you have a lot more to, to share than we can pack into this. Uh, <laughs> Where can people find you? I know you're living in Thailand and you're teaching there in person. And I don't know if you have any plans traveling soon. It's not maybe the best time at the moment, but do you have any other offerings that you could share coming up? Um, I am offering the teacher training that I do with the Maha videos. So for women to become teachers, it's, it's uh, I don't know many people doing teacher trainings for women. So it could be one of the only ones, I don't know, have to look around and research, but definitely with the Maha Vidyas, it's a very unique training and it's in Thailand. I'm not going to be traveling for, I think, for at least a year. Um, so for this year, it's in Thailand, it's in Koh Phangan, and that's a four week course uh, just for women. And it's going online. So it's really beautiful because anyone around the world can now do it. It's going to be ready in about four weeks time. Um, so at the, let's see, the middle of April. Um, and I'm also doing a 300 hour program. So you uh, can move from the 200 hour to the 300 hour. And this is such a beautiful program. It's 
it's split into 50 hour modules and you can do them so they're, they're all like uh, my favorite things in the world so it's like back to yoga and kirtan and then there's trauma informed yoga and then there's nature and yoga and all of this my lovely little subjects that i treasure and you can uh, do them at separate points you know because a 300 hour program is really intense and I thought it's too much to do all at once so you can separate them to 50 hours um, like maybe every three months you know you don't have to but it could just be one a year but then you have time to integrate you have time to bring that into your life mm. instead of doing the whole thing in one go and that's available in person and also online. Yeah, and on my website, which is LorraineTaylorYoga.com. We'll post that under the recording of this as well. And yeah, if you're curious and you want to know more, check out Lorraine's website and her courses. And thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, thank you so much for asking me. Very honored. Thank you.